So I'm riding a bear on a mountain, and the bear keeps beeping at me. And I'm wearing a bowler hat and a monocle? Yep, I don't remember any of this. Let's start over. Hey everybody, I'm Binkle Monkey, and welcome to the very first ever edition of Should You Finish It? The show where I play every video game that I've ever started, but never finished, and find out whether it's actually worth seeing those credits roll. Today's game is one of my more recent finishing fails, and it's been looming over me like Mount Coronet looms over the Hisui region. Pokemon Legends Arceus. Is that right? Is it Arceus? 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 Arceus. Arceus. Right, right, right. Only been saying that wrong for like... 18 years. Legends Arceus came out at what might be the most volatile time in Pokemon history. The series' last big entry, Sword and Shield, received a pretty mixed reputation among the fans. Despite the game selling more than 26 million copies to date, which makes it the second best-selling Pokemon game next to Red and Blue, or Green if you want to get all Japanese about it, there was still a lot for longtime fans not to like. Some were upset about the outdated graphics, others didn't like that the game replaced Mega Evolutions and Z-Moves with Dino Maxing. Damn boy, he's thick! That's a thick ass boy! But everyone was upset about one thing. Dexit. Prior to Sword and Shield's release, Game Freak announced that this game would be the first in the series to not have every Pokemon in franchise history available. This was shaving the national Pokedex from 890 total Pokemon at Sword and Shield's release down to 400. Okay, 401 if you get Mew from Pokeball Plus, but that's basically DLC, and that's a whole nother can of Wurmples for another time. But as you can guess, longtime fans took Dexit as a big double slap to the face. You've always been able to move your Pokemon from as far back as the Game Boy Advance to the current generation. It might take you transferring your Pokemon from a GameCube, to a GBA game, to a DS game, to Pokemon Bank, to Pokemon Home, if you want to use your favorite low tide you caught in Pokemon Coliseum but you can do it. Dexit pissed off a lot of longtime fans, and those fans were reasonably skeptical of what the Pokemon company had planned for their next game. Enter Pokemon Legends Arceus, an open world adventure set hundreds of years before the rest of the series in Generation 4's Sinnoh region. Mmm, Badoof country. Gen 4 has never been my personal favorite, but that's not really the story or location's fault, just the gameplay being comically slow in those games. <laughs> But with new gameplay and a whole new time period, I was hyped for this game's change up to the formula. I picked it up on release, played it for about 20 hours, really enjoyed it, and fell off for some reason. But where in the game did I stop? And why? Let's start at the beginning and find out. After choosing your base character design, you're immediately flung into the beginning of a Kingdom Hearts game. Oh my god, kids these days can't go two minutes in a dimension beyond space and time without reaching for their phones. And now we're the cosmic baby from 2001 A Space Odyssey. You wake up on a beach, and standing over you is by far the least handsome of all the Pokemon professors, Professor Leventon. He tells us that we fell out of the space-time rift in the sky, and asks if we're going to be able to survive on our own now. Dude, I'm a child. Help me. This is a reoccurring theme in the game, by the way. No one in the past cares about your well-being. He asks for your help wrangling the game's three starter Pokemon that have run off, and explains that all Pokemon have the amazing ability to shrink, and that's how they all fit into this brand new invention, the Pokeball. But like, if all Pokemon can shrink, why don't they just shrink to avoid being caught by humans entirely? Are you sure the Pokeballs don't force them to shrink? Oh well, we help him put the starters back into said Pokeballs. And thus begins the slow grind of the early game tutorial. The first 45 minutes of this game is a barrage of lore exposition and game mechanic basics. The professor leads us to Jubilife Village, which would later become Jubilife City in Diamond and Pearl. This is a settlement that the Galaxy team built as a base of operations for their expeditions in Hisui, which is what they called the Sinnoh region back then. We'll come back to that in a bit. But this time period and location together make a great setting for this game. This is the beginning of humans and Pokemon interacting with each other, at least in this region. Up until this point, most people believed Pokemon were nothing more than fierce nightmare creatures bent on unaliving humans. And throughout the game, you help integrate Pokemon into the lives of villagers through side quests. Doing these side quests net you items, expanding the inventory in the shop, new clothing and hairstyles, and even some new Pokemon on occasion. This is all happening during what looks like the Edo period of Japan's history, which is when the British 
British first made contact. In the game, Team Galaxy loosely represents the Brits, coming from elsewhere with different customs and ideas. Professor Leventon even implies he was originally from the Galar region, which is based on England, so that's a nice touch. The people who already inhabited Hisui slash Japan are represented by the Diamond and Pearl clans, but more about them later. Anyway, Team Galaxy does not want you loitering around their village. Everyone in town is suspicious of the freak in a t-shirt and shorts who fell out of the sky. Or maybe they're just jealous that we're the first kid in town to have our own cell phone. Either way, they're ready to kick us out and leave us to the elements if we don't start working to earn our keep. Like, immediately. They're like, oh, you look like you're about 15. Get a job, you bum. The box says it's a kid's game, but I'm not so sure about that. So you join the Survey Corps, and instead of fighting giant naked man-boy monsters, you're tasked with learning about this region's Pokemon and putting together the first ever Pokedex, which I thought was Professor Oak's whole deal in the first game, but eh, semantics. But to actually join the Survey Corps, you must pass the most grueling, intensive exam that has ever been dreamt up in Pokemon history. Catch a Bidoof. The juxtaposition between how hostile the people treat you and how handholdy the tutorial is could give you whiplash. You must pass this test, or we will leave you for dead in the wilderness. Never catch us a cutie woody widow beaver over there. But once you've learned the basics of battling and catching Pokemon, the very simple crafting system, the dodge mechanic, and how to do the creep, the game lets go of your hand. You're finally free to roam, and damn does it feel good. Gameplay is simple, but so addictive. Pokemon wander around the map, and it's your job to observe and catch them to fill out the Pokedex. Which might sound like regular Pokemon gameplay, but Legends Arceus puts its own twist on it. You see, in this game, different species of Pokemon react differently to you existing in their space. A Shinx, for example, thinks it's some serious hot shit, and if it sees you, it's gonna go full aggro. And now you have to choose between fight or flight, because if you don't, the Shinx is gonna attack you. And I mean, you, not your Pokemon, and by attack, I mean physically. Your human character has hit points in this game, and if you get hit too much, you're gonna white out. So you either gotta run away and recover, or send out one of your own Pokemon to defend your honor. This is such a refreshing twist on the classic gameplay. Like, this game could have been just like Sword and Shield, where if you run into a Pokemon on the map, it's just gonna initiate that classic turn-based battle. Instead, Legends Arceus puts the choice of initiating a turn-based battle squarely in the player's hands. If you don't send out your Pokemon, no wild Pokemon's gonna force a turn-based battle. They'll just smack you around. But when you do get into a regular battle, it feels different than other games. First, the speed of your attack can affect the turn order. The game has a Final Fantasy X-esque turn order meter to show who's gonna go next, and you can change the attack order by using different styles of attacks. Nearly every move has a regular, a fierce, or an agile style option. Fierce attacks hit harder, but may make you skip a turn while agile moves do less damage, but push you up in the turn order. This all adds a new level of depth to the battle system. Actually, there's a lot of fun quality of life adjustments in this game. You can relearn any move at any time while you're out on the field. You run out of Pokeballs? You can just craft some new ones anywhere as long as you've got the materials. They even made EV training easier with these new grit items that raise the stats for you without having to do the grind. This is truly the I don't got time for Pokemon game nonsense. Pokemon game. They even made it so you can run away from any non-trainer battle on your first try, because you just put the Pokemon back in its ball and start running like hell. Now you might be asking, why would you not want to battle? How are you going to catch Pokemon without battling them? Is he stupid? For one, some Pokemon will just run away from you if you get too close, and more often than not, they'll flee from a traditional battle situation too. So you have to sneak around in the tall grass and take it by surprise if you want to catch one. That's right, Pokemon don't live in the tall grass anymore waiting for you to find them. You are the one hiding in the tall grass waiting to strike these unexpecting Pokemon. Oh how the tables have turned. And the game has changed capture rates so that you don't always have to weaken a Pokemon to catch it. Sometimes just hitting a Mon in the back of the head with a Pokeball is enough. And if a flighty Pokemon is just too far away for you to hit with a Pokeball from the safety of the tall grass, you can convince the Pokemon to come a little closer by throwing a berry for them to snack on. Manipulating these situations so you can make the catch without battling could have been the entire game for me. It is so much fun, but it can definitely be stressful with extremely flighty Pokemon. Basically, any baby Pokemon was born ready to run from you, so you have to be especially gentle with them. But the feeling you get when you pull off one of those tricky catches is what keeps me wanting to play. They've also added Alpha Pokemon, which are Truly the chads of Pokemon. These red-eyed behemoths are a lot stronger than their regular versions. 
but you can catch them still, and they are welcome additions to your team. Personally, I love my Alpha Pichu. Just look at that big ass baby. It's adorable. So we're catching and battling Pokemon, and that's a really good time. But there's still more to the game than that. The real goal here is to fill out the Pokedex. And to do that, you need to acquire research points. Earn 10 research points for any species of Pokemon, and you've completed their Pokedex entry. And each Pokemon has its own specific criteria to earn said research points. They're straightforward methods like just catching the Pokemon or defeating them in battle, but you can also earn points by watching them use specific moves, catching them without being seen, or just feeding them a berry. Every Pokemon is different, and I'm so glad they made this mechanic so varied. If it was just catching 10 of each Pokemon, it would have gotten real samey real fast. And despite my Dexit rant earlier, I actually think capping the game at 252 Pokemon is a really good idea. Hear me out. It's nice that there are different ways to earn research points for all the different Pokemon, but can you imagine how ridiculously tedious it would be to earn 10 research points for all 900-ish Pokemon? That's 9,000 points, y'all! I haven't even done all 2,500 plus for this game because it's a big ask. So I think the 252 Pokemon included in this game is the right amount to make it a challenge, but not an overly daunting task. It's mostly Pokemon that existed in the Sinnoh region in the original Gen 4 games. The only problem with that is it grew greatly limits the number of Pokemon from generations 5 through 8 you can find. Like, there are only 22 Pokemon in the game from Gen 5 and on, not including new ones made for this game. And while it's sad that my Santa Conda don't get none, and that the Rallet line are literally the only Gen 7 Pokemon, they do spice up most of these newer old friends with new forms and new evolutions. For example, all the starters' final evolutions get new forms. For my first attempt at the game, I started with Rowlet, and was kinda disappointed with the look of Decidueye's new grass fighting type form, mostly because the Robin Hood themed original form was just so good. This time I started with Oshawott, and while the dark water type Samurott was great on my team, it kind of just looked like a shiny form of the original Samurott. Same with the Ghost Fire version of Typhlosion. The real highlights of the new designs, in my opinion, are the wooden Voltorb and Electro designs and Zorua and Zoroak's ghostly versions. Amazing theming here. I just wish you encountered them earlier in the game though. By the time I found Voltorb or Zorua, I already had a pretty well-balanced team that I was super attached to. I didn't want to give any of them up. Maybe that's just a me problem? But still. But Binkle Monkey, it's an open world game. Why didn't you just walk on over to where the Voltorb are and shove one into a mini replica of itself right away? Well, that's because Legends Arceus isn't a fully open world game. The map is broken up into five different areas, and you have to finish the story events of one area before moving to the next. This does gatekeep some pretty cool Pokemon until later in the story, like my boy Lucario, which is tragic, but it does help the game have a pretty solid story. Time for a lore dump. As I mentioned before, the native inhabitants of Hisui are the Diamond and Pearl Clan. And as you can expect with clans, they haven't always gotten along. They have a fundamental disagreement about what the almighty Sinnoh is. Sinnoh being, well, God. The Diamond Clan thinks Sinnoh is time, the Pearl Clan thinks Sinnoh is space, and everything is called space-time in this game, including these space-time distortions, which are the only places you can catch Pokemon that just do not belong in this time period at all. Like, what are you doing here, Porygon? You don't belong here, you weird-looking duck. But as the legend goes, Sinnoh granted special powers to certain Pokemon, and the clans consider their descendants to be noble Pokemon. And each noble Pokemon is served by a warden from one of the two clans. Sounds kind of like Nepo Babies to me, but they also believe that the almighty Sinnoh lives inside the space-time rift that you fell out of. But then the rift starts to shoot out lightning that strikes the noble Pokemon and sends them into a frenzy. Each clan thinks this was caused by the other clan praising Sinnoh wrong. So their leaders, Adamin and Araida, have to figure out what to do. Team Galaxy finds itself in the middle of this conflict and asks you to investigate the noble Pokemon and quell their frenzies. Disagreements on holy deities, countries, and other organizations stuck in the middle of the conflict? Come on, Pokemon, I play video games to escape real life. Don't do this to me. So you go area to area, meeting Diamond and Pearl Clan members, solving their personal problems for them, and making sure they learn a valuable lesson along the way. This all climaxes with you having a one-on-one -on -one battle with the noble Pokemon for each area, where you just chuck their favorite food at them over and over again. It's weird but pretty fun. And if you've been playing these games for as long as I have, you start to notice that a lot of these characters resemble characters from the games that happen later in the timeline. Like Captain Silene is clearly related to Team Galaxy's future leader, Cyrus. And Rizo is definitely Commander Mars's ancestor. You even run into the ancestors of the champion of the Sinnoh region, Cynthia. 
My favorite, though, Leon, is the ancestor of the rootin' tootin'est cowboy gym leader of them all, Clay. Drift fail city, me boys. Each area has a frenzied Pokemon and one you can ride. And I love the ride Pokemon in this game, partially because they're all new evolutions of old Pokemon. Except for Braviary, but at least it's a cool new form. Plus, you're flying over the level with them. What's not to love? You've also got the Speedy Weirdeer, Ursa Luna, who has a built-in item finder, Basque Legion, who lets you go out into the water, and Sneasler, who... I'm sorry, Sneasler? Sneasler? The best name for a new Sneasel evolution they could come up with is Sneasler? <sighs> Sneasler climbs rocks. These abilities let you explore new sections of areas you've already visited, giving each area more replayability. And that replayability was kind of why I stopped playing Legends Arceus the first time. Once you finish the third area and get Basque Legion, it's very tempting to go back and explore all the waterways you've only been able to drown in so far. So I went exploring, and good God was there a lot to find. I just kept finding more Pokemon and more places to explore, and honestly I got a little overwhelmed. I knew eventually I'd be able to climb rocks too, so I was just keeping mental notes of everywhere I thought there would be something cool, which was a lot of places because all of the terrain in this game is so damn rocky. But in trying to keep track of everything for future explorations, I burnt myself out in the present, so I decided to put the game down for a few days. But those few days turned into a few weeks, which turned into months, and the next thing you know, I don't remember any of the controls and I'm riding a bear on top of a mountain confused out of my mind. So this time through, I kept myself from exploring past areas and just kept pushing forward. I unlocked Sneasler and Braviary for the first time. I fought a giant Electrode and an even bigger Avalug. I saved all the frenzied noble Pokemon and was ready for the end game but we weren't at the end game yet. The story gets weird here. Things do not go according to plan. And this is where I put a pin in that because I don't want to spoil the end of this game for you because I think you should finish Pokemon Legends Arceus. Any Pokemon fan is gonna have a good time with this game. I think it might even be a pretty solid game for beginners to the series with its varied battle mechanics and smaller focus on battling in general. My biggest tip with this game is it's okay to leave a lot of backtracking for post-game play. The game already adds extra quests and more Pokemon after the credits roll, so don't get too down on yourself for not doing everything as soon as it's available to you. And if you're truly ambitious, there is a true ending you can get. Which I didn't, because this video took long enough to get out without me doing everything the game has to offer. But because this game is so much fun and I just enjoy it so much, I know I'm gonna come back and finish it eventually. I'm gonna make a mental note right now. I am going to beat this game Arceus Damage. Oh, oh so I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to take the Poke Lord's name in vain. It'll never happen again, I promise. Whew. Thank you all for watching. Did you finish Pokemon Legends Arceus, or did you get distracted by the open world like me? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, give us a like, or subscribe. Or if you really, really enjoyed it, consider joining the Patreon at patreon.com slash But until next time, thanks again, and have a good one.